And when did you know into your first experience with teaching online that you wanted to like dive all into teaching? Probably within the first couple of weeks, I was like, oh, okay, this is for me. I hadn't had that experience of feeling so drawn and connected to something before. Mm. So there was this unexplored area of academia. That, you know, I think for some people it might be like, well, duh, like that's the whole that's the whole point of academia is teaching. Um, but in a PhD that that's so research focused, it just mm. wasn't a part of my world. Hey folks, thank you for tuning in to the Grad School Sucks podcast, where we believe that your life and career after grad school should rock. I'm your host, Matt Carlson, and today I'm talking with my good friend, Dr. Ashley Walsdorf. Ashley is Assistant Professor of Couple and Family Therapy in the online program at Alliant International University, and Ashley joins the podcast today to talk about why she loves teaching and interacting with her students, common misconceptions about life as a teaching professor, and how teaching-oriented grad students can best prepare for applying to positions at teaching universities. If you want to make a career in teaching at the university level, this episode is for you. Anyway, I'm so excited to be able to share my conversation with Ashley with you today. Be sure to stick around until the very end of the episode to hear Ashley's responses to some extra questions. And without further ado, let's get to the interview. Well, Ashley, thank you for joining me today. It is so good to see you. Good to see could, you. Could you position yourself, just give us like a brief description of like who you are professionally and where you are and that kind of a thing? Sure. So I am an assistant professor at a private university in California. And I'm all, I'm also in private practice in Austin, Texas. It's very small, though I only have a couple of clients. And my my university, they don't require us to have a private practice, but they it's recommended. They would be mm-hmm. they would be bummed if we didn't. They um whether it's true or not, they feel that they give us the time to have a private practice. Mm-hmm. And yeah, there's just a strong sense of, um, so specifically I am teaching masters and PsyD students in marriage and family therapy. And there's a really strong belief that if you're going to be teaching that you better be practicing it. Otherwise, what are we doing here? For sure. For sure. And are you teaching anything in person or is it all online? It's all online. It's my job is 100% remote. It's in the universities in California. There are there are several campuses, five or six, all over California, and then the online program. So I'm entirely online on Zoom. Yeah, I go to California cool. twice per year for like a faculty meeting, but that's it. Okay, and what what's the online teaching life like? I've never I've never taught online. I love it. I yeah. I also don't have a point of comparison. I know um, in PhD, I think you got you got to teach your whole own class, right? Yeah. I didn't. I did co-teaching with someone who said that they didn't want me teaching because it was going to be their name on the course evaluations. So I got to do two guest lectures and I I just didn't teach. And that mm-hmm. was my co-teaching. So I I really, a lot of people have said to me like, oh, gosh, I can't believe you're totally online. That's so boring in comparison to in-person teaching. I just feel like that's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. And I don't know the difference. I I think it's pretty great. It may be that that in-person would be better for me for whatever reason, but I don't. It's like if you don't have a smartphone, you don't need a smartphone like until, until you get one, then you realize that you need that thing, but I've never taught in person. So I don't, there's no sense of feeling like I need that thing. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so how did you get this job? Did you, did you know a professor there or something like that? Um, no, I did not. And I, I think about this a lot in terms of, I, I ask myself a lot if it was smart that I did a postdoc 
because mm. I'm not sure that that benefited my career be, because I, this is kind of going to be a long story, but because I ended up at a teaching institution where the amount that we have to publish, like our scholarship component is so limited. I'm not sure if the postdoc made a lot of sense for me. And yet the only reason I got this job is because during COVID they needed an additional adjunct at this university in California I was postdocing and had, I was also a, an entirely remote postdoc because I started during COVID and I had the extra space. So mm. one of That's my, right. one of my like colleagues, collaborators, they had asked her, she's in North Dakota. She said that she didn't have the space, but she recommended me and we just really needed the money at the time. So mm. I was like, sure, I can teach on the side. No problem. And then I started doing that and I was like, okay, this is it. This is it yeah. for me. Cause I didn't, I didn't have the experience to know that I would even like that. It wasn't teaching, wasn't really a part of my reality, but I was feeling very it's kind of sad in the research world. I, mm. it's not that I don't like research, but doing research completely is just not for me. I was working for, an associate professor at University of Texas, and, and she funds her entire salary with grants, 100% of her salary. And she loves it. I mean, she yeah. just loves it. We would write grants together and she would be like, this is so fun. <laughs> and I would be like, no, it's not. Um, <laughs> I, but I, I loved her. And so yeah. that was my motivation. I, and I was learning a lot. That was my motivation to stick around for two years was... Uh, for me, it's really been like all about the people. But anyway, that's, that's awesome. my very long story about how I got this job. So then they had yeah. positions for full time and I immediately applied. No, that's great. And, and I knew I knew there was some connection, uh, so, some connection that you had to the job. That's why I asked you if you knew somebody there, because I'd remember that like it wasn't something that you just like cold applied to. Um, mm -mm. And I anyway. wouldn't I wouldn't have. I didn't. Right. This university was not on my radar at all. Mm. So yeah. I just sort of stumbled on it. What was your first class that you taught? It was a PsyD class at the San Diego campus for mm. advanced marriage and family therapy theories, mm. specifically the older theories. Like in, in family therapy, we kind of separate out the modern and postmodern theories. So it was the f theories from like the fifties to the eighties, the modern theories. Okay. And when did you know, how long had you been in your postdoc before you started teaching? About a year and a couple months. Year and a couple months. And when did you know into your first experience with teaching online that you wanted to like dive all into teaching? I think Probably within the first couple of weeks, I was like, oh, okay, this is for me. And re I'm really soon. I don't know, maybe at that same time. I, I, I hadn't had that experience of feeling so drawn and connected to something before. Mm. I really, I don't have that as a therapist. I don't have that as a supervisor. I don't have that as a researcher. So there was this unexplored area of academia uh, you know i think for some people it might be like well duh, like that's the whole that's the whole point of academia is teaching um but in a phd that that's so research focused it just mm -hmm. wasn't part of my world yeah yeah and we were in a phd that was like i feel pretty research oriented some of my friends had experiences uh where they got to teach like every year during their yeah. PhD program. Yeah, yeah, we were, I didn't know of any PhD students who were TAs. It was only mm -hmm. master's students. And I, I was, had also been a research assistant as a master's student. So it, it just, yeah, we had very limited, we had kind of in our PhD, we had that one opportunity to, I think you fully taught a class, then it got changed to co-teaching mm -hmm. and because my co-teaching experience wasn't 
really anything. Yeah. I just didn't, I didn't get that. Yeah. So what do you feel like the pros and cons are of the like postdoc life versus teaching online life? I think that postdoc life, to be clear, I had a really great postdoc. I loved my boss. I, when I, when I look back on like my experience in PhD and why it was hard, it was mostly about the people. Mm. There were, there was lots of, I know this word gets used so much, but it just, it felt really toxic a lot of the time. It felt that there were a lot of people living in the mentality of like, it was hard for me, so I'm going to be sure it's hard for you. And so by the time I got to my postdoc and I was working with someone who was really lovely, sorry, I have to cough. Um, That made a huge difference. And I know you didn't ask this question, but I think for anyone who is listening and thinking about where they want to go, my, my recommendation is like, look at the people. If Mm. you're like reaching out to people and they're not responding to you, that's not going to change. Like, don't, don't let yourself believe that that's just a one-off thing. Like how, how they, how they respond and act to you early on, I think is a lot of how it's going to be. So anyway, the, the postdoc, it was great. I, I did get to do my own research project, which was really big for me, as opposed to mostly what I was doing was writing like R01, R21 grants for my my boss and my team. Um, but certainly I, I got a lot of publications from it. It was a nice pause between the PhD and now teaching, which is very, very busy. It was this nice Mm -hmm. pause to, I got out most of the manuscripts I had sitting from PhD, not all of them, but most of them. And I think if I had jumped into my teaching position, that would have been a lot harder. So that was a pro. I can't remember what the actual question is. It was something about teaching versus postdoc. Yeah. Pros and cons. Pros and cons. Um, cons for the postdoc. I don't like research that much. That's mm. a con. I, I really don't. What I've learned about teaching that I like so much is there's this really immediate and constant feedback loop of like, I put something out, students respond. It's usually really interesting. I learn from them. I feel like we're kind of creating something really interesting together live. And that could be said about therapy, but for whatever reason, it's just not my experience as much. I don't, I, therapy is very focused on what the client that you have in front of you and their situation. And I'm definitely more of like a heady theorizer kind of person. I like to exist in that space. And so I just, my cup gets filled kind of continually from teaching in ways that it doesn't from therapy. And it definitely doesn't from research unless with the exception of the moments I'm physically like interacting with research participants, but that's such a small, such a small segment of like what research is about. Right. Right. And so, yeah, so con for me, it's, it's interesting. You're asking, I think about, pros and cons of the positions, but (laughs) my mind is kind of stuck on pros and cons of research, pros Mm -hmm. and cons of teaching, uh, because that's what the postdoc was just 100% about research. For sure. So knowing what you know now about how much you enjoy teaching, if you were to go back and like, let's say, redo some of your grad school experiences, and then, um, yeah, the career path after grad school, what would you do differently? It would be easy for me to say that I would have ex- like looked for a teaching opportunity in graduate school. I don't know about the actual feasibility of that. We just, hmm. we were so bogged down with so many things. I'm not sure I'd change anything. Like yeah. that's, that's the thing I don't want to, keep coming back to this point, but I do feel if I hadn't done the postdoc, 
I probably wouldn't have found this teaching position. I don't know where mm-hmm. I'd be. I was thinking about leaving academia. Um, like for years, I was pretty sure I was going to leave academia. The only thing keeping me was the people that I ultimately I found really great people. And I was, so I was pretty sure I was going to leave. And then, you know, I stumbled upon this. It's hard for me to, because I stumbled upon it, it's hard for me to say like, oh, I would have done X, Y, Z differently because no idea where I would have ended up if I had done that. For sure. So I feel that I've landed at a really good place kind of by chance. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think, I mean... I'm interested in the online aspect. Um, do you think you would ever like hunger to be like in person teaching or like on an actual physical campus? Or do you enjoy like what online brings to your career? Yeah, I I can't say if someday I might really want to be in person it is true that because I've never had that experience, it's not something that I miss. I, it would almost have to be a situation where I got asked. Uh, there's actually a small university in Austin that I'm thinking about adjuncting for and just picking up an extra class. So that would be my window into being in person. I think that's the only way I would like develop that hunger is if I had the experience and and felt for whatever reason that it was better. But the thing about online is like I have students all over the country, um, sometimes in different parts of the world, you know, they hop over to Turkey because their family's there and they're there for a couple of weeks. And the flexibility is just it's so nice. I I find that I, whatever I have going on in my life, I can still make this job work. So in a couple of weeks, I'm going to a conference. I'll still just be teaching as normal. I don't have to like disrupt the flow of the semester for my conference. And it's very convenient. And I feel that once you have that convenience, it's hard to go back from like almost the opposite of what you're asking which is like, will you ever hunger to be in person? I don't know. It's it's just like so convenient and uh, convenience is king. And I do feel that the connection is still there. I feel very connected with students. I do, you know, virtual office hours and lots of meetings with students. And I just don't know. I don't have a point of comparison, but right now it's hard for me to imagine what I'm missing out on. So we have some some questions from Instagram. Actually, can I say something that I yeah that go for it? As we've been talking, I realized that with this job, um, it's not just that I realized that I love teaching. I also had like such a wonderful experience with the people. Mm. So my bosses were so great. And I, there was a strong sense of feeling like for the first time that I am proud or like buy into what it is that I'm selling because we're Mm. selling something in academia. So I just want to add that, that and not, not over focused that like, Oh, like randomly I found something that I really love. That's true. But I also, for me, like the system and the people just make the biggest difference. And it was really, it was at the end of the day, it's really about that. I, I have, I drank the Kool-Aid, so to speak for this university where I Mm. feel really committed to the mission. And I, I, I don't know enough to say it's the mission of the university, but certainly the mission of the the program directors and the system-wide program director. Uh, I just feel very invested in them and their process and what they what they believe in. And I, I feel that they really, um, they're not just like paying lip service to these different values. I, I really see them living by them. And that's, that's very special. And I think that that's the thing that makes me deeply committed to this job beyond that. I love teaching. 
It's awesome. Yeah. Hmm. Just wanted to be clear about that and not, I don't want to paint a picture that, that it's just about, for me, it's not just about finding something I like. It's about finding like a system and a group of people who I believe in. And that's, for me, that's much more sustainable than doing work that I like at any given time. Hmm. And what would you say it is about the mission of this university compared to others? It's hard for me to answer that question because I feel that it's on like all levels. But at the end of the day, I feel that this, I can't speak about this university. I don't know enough yet, but this program that I'm working for, I feel really cares about the experience of students, really takes student feedback seriously, tries to make Mm. changes, Um, very collaborative, very diverse. For the first time, when I... Um, When I started adjuncting, I was like, okay, so there are five program directors. Four of them are women and three of them are women of color. And, And the overall director is a woman of color. Like that's not standard in academia. That's, that's really pretty special. So I started looking at that the people in leadership positions are very diverse um, lots of uh, international folks at this university, lots of g- diversity in terms of gender and sexual orientation and all kinds of different things, gender identity, and just a really special group of people who, who I, I think really cares about student experience. Mm which is new. That was pretty new for me. I don't, I never felt that in my programs, anyone cared too much about student experience. Not anyone at, you know, that I ultimately got a mentor who cared very much, but it took took a lot of years. Yeah. And you know, I've, I've heard, um, Maybe not what you said specifically, but I've heard people who have gone on to teaching universities to teach there talk about like, it's just like a better environment. Um, And that's not always the case, of course, but. uh, It can't always be the case, right? But I, I don't know that this environment that why I like it so much has to do with it being a teaching university. Hmm. It may, it may, uh, perhaps there is an element of that when you're in an institution that values teaching first and foremost, there's more space to be concerned with student experience. Right. Yeah. Um, or it's, it's very clear that the thing that you're selling is your teaching. So then that, that might translate to, um, I don't know what I'm saying. It might, that that systemic thing might translate to people who care more about teaching, have more agency in their teaching. I'm not sure. It's hard. I don't have enough um, like institutional experience to speak broadly about any of these things. For sure. For sure. Well, unless you had something else you wanted to, to say so, specifically about that. Just- vomit uh no i was like oh i gotta speak about the mission no it was good so it's all about let's see i thought this one was interesting uh for someone who loves teaching at university but wants higher pay what do you do so you know generally like research-oriented professors make more than teaching professors at teaching institutions generally. Um, what what do you see as ways to like maximize your income and your position? Oof. Um, I think that like industry, academia is just another industry. It's just another mm. like, bad business and the way that we maximize our income is to 
um, mm-hmm. have people need us and then have other opportunities. Mm. So I think even if you're really comfortable where you're at, it's probably smart to always stay up to date on jobs. There's so for mm. our field, there is like an unheard of amount of jobs open right now. It's so, it's so wild. It's like in at really big universities, like University of Minnesota is a huge and old marriage and family therapy program. They have a position open right now. That's like, I never would have imagined that that would happen in, in a time that I could apply for it. So right. I think um, obviously like do a good job so that your job wants to keep you and then spend some time also applying for other jobs because if you get another offer and your university wants to keep you, they will likely bend to do so. I also think ideally in a teaching university, you have a little bit more time, um, I feel, I feel that I have time to add things. I can't say if I would feel that way in our one life, maybe I would. Um, but definitely like I can pick up adjuncting elsewhere if I want. I have my private practice. I do some on the side, like dissertation editing. So I'm always, I'm always kind of hustling for the side gigs. Sure. I don't know that that the person who wrote this question, I don't, I don't know that they were hoping for a side gig kind of answer. I imagine that they weren't. That's not really what anyone wants to hear is like, oh, you have to get another job. Ideally you don't, but I think the side gigs can be fun and we can be pretty creative with them. But as far as increasing your income at your university, don't yeah don't forget about applying to, to applying to other things yeah. and, and having an offer that you then go back to your current job with also finding out like what your job really values what is the thing that's going to uh, the, uh, in my experience they'll be pretty honest about that like the when i got hired they told me like we think you can get promoted quicker because of the postdoc and all of these publications. So I found out through those conversations that they value scholarship more than I assumed that they would have in terms of being promoted, making more money. And how how they explained it to me is like, it's publicity for us in this business. You, you publish, you present, brings in more students. And so then you're a more valuable employee. Very even cool. though it's a teaching institution yeah that makes a lot yeah of that's sense. that question um if i had it figured out if only i had it figured out i don't of course and i'm always hustling to make more money yeah so just one thing i thought of when we had a, a little break was also just because you're at a teaching university doesn't mean that you can't pursue grants and if you look at who makes money in r1 institutions it's the people with grants that's that can also be true at a private university or a teaching university so i would just encourage folks to not forget just because you're at a teaching university grants don't have to be off the table so you get a lot of the same perks with grants you get course buyouts you can increase your own salary with grants so those are good options Probably in private universities, the way to make money if you're not going to go the grant route is to become an administrator. Yeah. So hopefully, if you want to make money, hopefully you like administration. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. So here's one I thought was interesting for you. Now that you're faculty, what do you do to remedy the toxic culture of academia and promote healthy work-life balance for you and your students? Oh boy. <laughs> um on a on like a student level, I would like to think that I'm quite collaborative. I don't um 
I'm not a fan of like arbitrary rules and arbitrary deadlines. So, you know, I tell students like, I'm always happy to give you an extension. Just let me know what's going on. I tell students the syllabus to me kind of feels like a guideline and we're going to look at it together and figure out if it works for us. And so I like to make the syllabus collaborative, change assignments as needed. I I find for the most part academic exercises to be pretty I wouldn't call them toxic. That's like too strong of a word for the academic exercise. But we came from a program where the faculty literally said more is more. And I just don't agree. It's very clear what gets you ahead in academia. And so we should be asking students to do things that will get them ahead, not asking them to do things just for the sake of like busy work or or Mm. doing work. So the academic exercise, I'm not a fan of. I... I try really hard to avoid that. Like just as an example, I was in a doctoral exam yesterday. It was a, it was a clinical comprehensive exam. And we had some feedback for the student that one of the faculty had concerns that the student hadn't showed certain elements in their therapy videos. And it seemed like the group was kind of leaning toward asking the student to go back and either make more videos or find more video, already existing video. And I just said, like, wait a minute, what what would be the purpose of that? Like, the student knows that this is the feedback. We would have liked to see more of it. But to have, like countless hours spent on finding more video like how is that that's just an academic exercise in my mind so I voted against that and the the group ultimately said like okay yeah you're right let's not do that Mm -hmm. so I think um for me trying to decrease toxicity by being collaborative not asking students to do things that I don't think will get them ahead or are meaningful Work-life balance is a challenge. I feel I can do a lot to help students with work-life balance in terms of just negotiating things with them. If they have life events going on, uh, if they're sick, like renegotiating assignments, canceling assignments if needed, all of that is easy to do and talk about. I am not sure that I've really achieved good life balance, work-life balance, but I do feel that my system would want that for me. And that means a lot to me. So even if I don't have it, the fact that I feel um, that that's a hope that the system has for me is really, there's something about that that's really positive. And yeah, I think... I notoriously don't have very good boundaries, hence not very good work-life balance. Like if a if a student has not an emergency, but they, they're messaging me, they're emailing me because they have something, I can tell that they urgently want a response, I will urgently give that response. Like I definitely take on other people's emergencies as my own and then respond from that place. So that's not great for work-life balance, but I'm working on it sort of. I also, the reality is I kind of like it. There's something, there's something sick about like us academics that like, we really kind of like it. We like to work until 11 PM. We like to be looking at our emails while we're in bed at 11 PM. And when we wake up at six, we like to check our phones first thing. And like, I don't, I like it. And it hasn't, it hasn't yet affected my life negatively it's different when you're in a place of burnout and I'm not in that place. I'm not in that place for probably the first time in a long time. And that's That's pretty, um, you know, the question is if my practices that I'm talking about are going to lend themselves to burnout. We're not sure. Only time will tell. Yeah. That's a really, that's a, a hard question. I'm not sure of a short answer, but yeah, we think, collaboration is inherently not toxic i think like there's something about true collaboration that not a lot of toxicity can enter that space 
Very cool. And that's at all levels, right? With administrators, that's all levels looking up and looking down. So another question from Instagram. Have you ever considered industry and do you think you'll ever consider industry in the future? Totally have considered industry. It's a little bit hard for me to imagine what an industry job would look like for me. I'm not a I'm not a data person. That's not what feeds me. I would have to be offered like a ridiculous salary to to do something with data to get over the fact that you know it, I I would have to be that I'm relying on my income to feed me and and fill my cup uh, because I don't think I'd be getting it from my job. Mm. I'd have to it, there'd have to be a really specific industry position I think for me to go to that at this point. I was totally sold on industry when I was in my postdoc because I was feeling like I can't do this anymore. But I'm not sure I would have found the home in industry that I've now found. But who knows? I don't know enough about industry, honestly. I don't know enough about what opportunities are available in industry. For someone like me, who's very people-oriented, like I want to have that that human interaction all the time, most of the time as my primary focus. If I don't have it, I tend to burn out pretty quickly. Because I don't, I need this like really immediate feedback for, for the work and energy I put in. I need really immediate feedback about it that in, in the realm of connection. And if I don't have that, I can't sustain that for very long. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, what kind of, what kind of industry jobs are there? Do you feel like your listeners know about that? Like, what are what are their options if they want to be in industry? Um, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of options. I, the ones that I know are about data. So, you know, data analyst work. Um, if you get really deep into coding, data science. There's also, like, research in industry I've uh, talked about that a bit with Savannah in episode okay. 004. And she's 004, a qualitative researcher, right? She's actually done both. She's done okay. qualitative and quantitative. Um, but yeah, so she does. she's done that for, I think, three or four different companies in industry. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So I, I think there are... A lot of positions. I think the exact titles can vary a lot. And I think there's there's a lot more of like, I feel like in academia, it's kind of like, this is who I am. This is what I bring to the table. These are my things. You know, I research this area. I have this, this specialty. I have this knowledge I can provide. Whereas in industry, it's more like, we have these problems. Can you help us solve these problems? And so mm-hmm. it's it's much more like, becoming flexible in what you do and bring to the table to like add value to the company instead of like, I have this one thing here, you can borrow it for a while, kind of, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I have thought about like user experience Mm -hmm. industry positions. Although when I think about I'm interested in people's experience in so far as I like to, to partner with people to decrease suffering. And I'm not sure that someone's experience like with an app really has much to do <laughs> with the realm of decreasing suffering. I'm not sure I could do that long term. Yeah, yeah. It does feel unfortunate when an app doesn't work like you want it to, but yeah, I don't know if it would <laughs> qualify as suffering per se. Yeah. And you know, I, I say suffering very kind of loosely. I do think that a lot of students in graduate school suffer. So I'm committed to like decreasing suffering in that arena. It doesn't have to be this like, of course I'm not solving world hunger or 
you know, war and not decreasing genocide. Just if I can make people's lives a little bit easier in ways that matter Mm. more than using an app, I think is probably my jam. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. It is academic job season. And I think a lot of people right now are applying to jobs. They've already applied and they're waiting. Maybe they're prepping job talks. What what was the – I know you, you said you taught as an adjunct at your university before going on as a full professor. Mm-hmm. What was the process like in terms of like um, – did you have to apply to teach that class? Uh, what was that like? And then – what should students who are wanting to apply to teaching oriented universities, what should they be doing and thinking about during this job market season? So I didn't have to apply to be an adjunct. And so my university has tons of adjuncts. It's just the the program, my current program I teach for has hundreds of students. So we need mm. lots of adjuncts to teach many classes. And usually the adjuncts come by way of recommendation from someone else. They supply a CV and they have a brief like 30 minute interview. And so it's not this, it's not the same. It's definitely, um, you know, it's a very low pressure situation and not your traditional application process. I do think that adjuncting really helped me get this full time position, hmm. not just because it gave me the teaching experience that I was missing, but also because the, the administrators had all of my course evaluations. They had evidence that I kind of you know, worked, work, works well with others. <laughs> um, you know, they had a little bit of experience with me that I think was really invaluable when I went to apply. Hmm. And I, I would like to think that that is what set me apart from other applicants is that they already knew me. And they, I think that there was a sense from both of us of, of goodness of fit. But as far as suggestions for others, I think Um, certainly if you want to apply for a teaching university, it would be great if you had some teaching experience. If you do not, I think you can still make an argument that you would be good for the position. There is a lot of, it's not just about your teaching experience, but also your teaching philosophy. So you're going to have to write a teaching philosophy for any job application. And I do think that that matters. And what, what I've found, the now that I'm faculty, I participate in other people's job talks and give feedback. And one thing that I don't like to see is too much idealism, like too much, too much saying things like, I, you know, cater to the needs of every student and I'm flexible for what every student needs. Well, I have 80 students this semester. So unfortunately, like that sounds really nice, but that's, I just, I can't be present to the needs of 80 people. So being, um, having a teaching philosophy that is doable and practicable, I think is, is really important. Is practicable a word? It can practical, be. doable, practical, and practicable maybe is the word. Um, so yeah, I think there is a tendency for people who don't have a lot of teaching experience. There's a tendency to get really idealistic about like, you end up writing how you would teach in the real world. And in my experience, you end up writing about how you would teach in a perfect world. And in my experience, the people on the other side listening to that don't really like that. They think, they think, um, you're not going to be prepared to do this because it's not perfect and it's really messy. And I want to hear more about how you think you would handle the nitty gritty icky. So 
But yeah, I actually, that question is actually really hard for me to answer because I don't have experience going out and applying. I didn't apply for any other jobs when I applied for this job. And that's actually, that's something that I do. I I applied for one PhD program. I applied for one job after PhD. I didn't get it. That's how I ended up in Texas. I wanted to be in DC for the a policy fellowship, didn't get it didn't have any other options. So I moved to Texas for a treatment job. Um, I, you know, I applied for one postdoc and now I've applied for one teaching position. I, I'm mm-hmm. very, I get very pigeonholed in my, like, I want to do this one thing and I don't have backup options. Yeah. So I, Did it's you... hard for me to speak to that question, broadly speaking. For sure. So. Yeah. In going from the uh, adjunct to full position, did they have you like formally apply or anything like that? Oh, yeah. So that was a traditional. So I did, um, I submitted my application, which was a cover letter, a research, a two page single space research statement, two page single space teaching philosophy. Um, I think one to two page single space statement of valuing diversity, some, some sort of kind of broad diversity statement. And, you know, then the usual like transcript CV sample publications. And I had four interviews. So the first interview was with the heads of the search committee, which were three program directors And that was an hour long interview and they either recommend that you proceed or they don't recommend that you proceed. Then I did the traditional job talk, which was on Zoom. Um, I think at this point they're doing most job talks on Zoom because of money. They don't, you know, Mm. I think a lot of universities have found like zoom works pretty well and then we don't have to pay to fly people out sure so it was on zoom there were probably 10 to 15 faculty there the thing that made me so anxious i was i was like beside myself with anxiety i think i think because i had decided i wanted this job so bad that I didn't, it wasn't like applying to many jobs and seeing what works out. It was like, I need this job. So I was just like, I, I don't think I slept for a few days before my interview. <laughs> uh, but it was a, a, the presentation that I had to do included a research presentation, pretty standard research presentation, essentially like paint us a picture of your research program and go in depth on at least one research project. And then a presentation of my teaching, my mentoring, and my supervision. So the supervision part is going to be variable for a clinical program, but I think the other parts are pretty standard. And then the worst part, the question and answer part of the mm. of the interview, I just bumbled around like they asked me really, really tough questions and really good questions. I'm glad they asked. I was very underprepared for that part. I it was one of those things where I left being like, I don't know how I did. I I felt I felt really good about my presentation component, but the question and answer, which is arguably the most important I think I kind of flopped around on that. But um, so then I had an interview with the, we call it the system wide director. I'm trying to think what a, it'd probably be synonymous with a department head at a research or public university, potentially synonymous with a dean, depending upon how big the program is. But like I, I call her my boss boss. So I had an interview with her and, but yeah, the short answer is I had four interviews. Yeah. I think that's fairly standard. Is that your sense? Um, I only had two. Well, I had a phone or zoom. No, maybe I had a phone interview and then a zoom 
and then an in-person or just a Zoom and then an in-person? Yeah, I mean, the um, job talk is standard, yeah. but I think it's also fairly standard that if they're going to, if they want to continue exploring the, you as an option, that then you go to like the department head and ultimately the dean. I'm pretty familiar with the dean being the last interview. Yeah, that makes sense. It's from friends and obviously not personal experience since I applied for one job. Yeah. Well, what what do you think, what are the top things that you think grad students today should know about life after grad school? I think that life always gets better when you feel free. Mm. And life after grad school could either be more of the same. If you're like, if you're in grad school and you're in a toxic system and you enter another toxic system, not much is going to change. Uh, but if you feel in a, a healthy, well-functioning system, there's definitely a lot more freedom that is available and freedom is sustainable. My life after grad school has been ups and downs. I, I did lots of different things, some of which I didn't like. I didn't, I did not like working in addiction treatment. That was not my jam. I was mm. arguably more miserable than I was in grad school. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I think just like life in grad school, I think for life after grad school, you, you need to find your people. So who are the people who are good collaborators, who are the people who show up, who do what they say they're going to do, who are there for you, who are flexible. And I would, I would want that for every grad student. I really think grad school could be a lot less painful if we had better people. So, I mean, the toxicity comes from people, right? It's not just some of it. Some of it is a broken system, but it's also how the players in that broken system respond to it. Yeah. And so many academics just don't, I don't know what it's about. I don't know if it's about being out for numero uno or, or why, why so many academics are, just not very nice yeah. I feel like I work with really nice people and that's really important to me uh, what else can I say about life after grad school it's cool when you get to set your own deadlines mm. just freedom I feel that there can be freedom in grad school too unfortunately there aren't a lot of systems promoting freedom. If I had to guess, uh, probably a lot of my students don't feel free. And I, my best hope is that together we kind of create a safe enough space that they could tell me that and we could address it. Cause that's, that's the big thing. A lot of, a lot of grad students feel that they have to be silent mm. and suffer in silence. And one of the biggest reasons that I love my job now is I feel I have a voice for the first time in a long time. That's really important. That's awesome, actually. Yeah, thank you. I, it's really good. And I, I wish that for everyone. I know that some of these ideals are like, oh, you want to be free and you want to have a voice. Well, the job market sucks. And like most of us are just trying to scrape by and get any job. So the, the the question remains like how do you choose freedom in a voice when like you just need a fucking job i don't know it's yeah. hard what, what do you think uh every grad student who's let's say going on the job market and wanting to do wanting to go into teaching what should they what's one thing that all these students should do. It could be something small they do today or in a week, it could be something big they do over the next year, prepping for the job market. Um, 
in academia, you can never do just one thing because you have to be good at everything and you have to have evidence that you're good at everything. But insofar as teaching goes, um, think really hard about your teaching philosophy, what matters to you and, and finding a, and being able to tell a good story about, you know, why you care about education, what your teaching philosophy is, what kind of pedagogy you follow, and being able to have examples. My my teaching philosophy was just full of examples of guest lectures, but that's what I had. And I think that even though the examples were just guest lectures, much better than to not have examples. So pretty much, I think on academic job documents, like academia values evidence, right? Like we cite everything. So in your job documents, every single thing that you say, you have to be able to support by some example of how you've actually done that. I think a lot of people, especially people like me who love operating in theory world, forget that, that evidence is king in the academy. And so bringing out evidence for every single thing you say you do and care about. Yeah. That feels really important. Yeah. Well, any, any uh, last thoughts or anything on your mind before we wrap things up? There's probably more to say about money. Go for it. <laughs> I'm kidding. I don't. No. Um, of course there's more to say about money. I, what I really wanted to say I really wanted us to have a conversation about how academia is a bad business that won't admit okay. that it's a business. What do you mean by that? I think that the academy is a business that runs very similar to industry, very similar. Okay. But academia won't admit that it's a business. It pretends like it's this other thing and it you know pretends that it's not all about the money like everything else is and that's just not true mm. and you know all of the within that it's a business like again that idea of like academia is selling something to students but they won't admit that they're selling it especially public institutions where they're like, oh, it's this really fair trade, like your labor for tuition come now. Like, you know, so I actually don't have a ton that I need to say about it, but I just, that's my new thing is that academia is a business who won't admit it's a business. And I just want to say that as like a little catchphrase without having to yeah. explain it. <laughs> no, I love it. That's great. And I, I definitely agree. I mean, all of the administrators run it like a business. You know, the professors who are more into like the research and the grants and everything, many of them run it like a business. And, um, you know, I, I think there's value to running it like a business if that's the metric of success that you're after, you know, maximizing well, the grant dollars and the publications. It's the metric of success that the academy is after. Sure. And so yeah. only people who run things like a business do well in academia in terms of salary, in terms of being promoted. And that's not to say like business isn't bad. My partner is a business person. Like I don't, I don't have this sort of like blanket sense that business is bad. And I, my mentor from PhD um, who's just phenomenal. I just so lucked out to get to be with her. Um, she didn't just because she was running a business doesn't mean that she didn't do good work or that she didn't yeah. treat us, her employees really well. But I think she was, she's kind of a rare, kind of a rarity in, yeah. in the mix of things. I, I got so lucky. I, when I look around at like the people I get to collaborate with now, I'm just like, I don't know how I got here. Like so, so lucky. And truly it's, it's all about the people. Yeah. In this, yeah, business, I agree. in this bad business. That acts <laughs> like it's not a business. 
seriously wow. just will not admit that it's a business. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. Uh, if, if folks want to reach out to you or follow along in your journey, how should they connect with you? I would email me at my university email. Um, how, how should I go about letting folks know what that email is? You can just say it or spell it here. And then I can do like a, like a clickable link in the episode description. Got it. Okay. So it's my first name, Ashley, A-S-H-L-E-Y dot last name, Walsdorf, W-A-L-S-D-O-R-F at Alliant, A-L-L-I-A-N-T dot E-D-U. Very Go cool. Alliant. Go Alliant. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, Ashley. It was great of to catch course. up with you. It was fun. Good to see you. Good to it see you. It was fun to talk about money. It was. Love the money. <laughs> All right. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Folks, thank you for tuning in to the Grad School Sucks podcast. I hope you got a lot out of my interview with Ashley today. Hearing her talk about her love for teaching and interacting with her students was really great to hear. Be sure to check out the description of today's episode for links to Ashley's email if you want to get in contact with her. And if you did end up enjoying today's episode, please consider leaving a review. It really does mean a lot to me as a content creator when folks leave reviews for the podcast, and it helps others find the podcast too. As always, I'm your host, Matt Carlson, and I look forward to bringing you another great episode next week. And as promised, here are Ashley's responses to the bonus questions. See you all later, and stay scholarly. Right now. Like what um, the email I would be? Yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it'll go in like the very end of the podcast episode. Most people don't even get to it. So it's mm. just uh, just for fun, for warming up. Perfect. Um, well, you already know the animal one. I would what? be an otter. <laughs> 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 why would you be an otter um i just think that they're like particularly cute and cool yeah also hermione granger on harry potter her patronus is an otter and mm. you know i love me some hp you do you do yeah. um uh sidebar we <laughs> went to uh trivia recently and there was some i don't think it was harry potter trivia but it was another Thing like that anyway it was fun it made me think of you we'll edit nice. this out later I um love the Harry Potter trivia but i also like couldn't handle it it became really yeah clear. yeah, yeah. Was, i mean there's some super nerds out there who just riff and know everything it it mm. blew my mind i studied but, so hard and we still we didn't even make it to the final duel at the end yeah it was fun though <laughs> yeah. what would you say your superpower is I don't know. Um, maybe empathy. I feel like I'm a pretty empathic person and it's probably a superpower and also a curse sometimes. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. My follow-up question was going to be, what do your friends, what would your friends say your superpower is? And that's what I would have said for you. Something like that. Oh, really? My partner would have said he calls me the quality assurance manager of like our life and our home and and our bodies. Like he mm -hmm. just says that I can find something wrong with anything in like a second. Hmm. That's what, that's what he would say. My superpower is. I like that too. Yeah. Hmm. If you could magically transport to any one place at any time you wanted to but it had to be the same place every time, where would you go? That's really easy for me because of our contacts. I would pick India. Ah, uh, right. Specifically, um, Kerala or Cochin is the city. Um, just be a family there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you know that we're going there in yeah. uh, November? Yeah. I heard about that. Yeah, yeah it's really for exciting. Like two months really awesome yeah 
but I, mm. I it's like a 48 hour plane ride like no no magic transport there how long of a, a plane ride it's like when it's all said and done with all the layovers and all the multiple oh, it's, right. it's like 40 hours holy shit yeah wow. 40 40 hours of travel i think the longest plane ride is like 13 or 14 jesus to to turkey yeah yeah that's an adventure a so magic adventure. magic transport would be like super cool and we would go all the time we'd just like pop in and pop back yeah no that totally makes sense we'd be like hi mom can you when you magic transport like that can you bring things or is it just your body it's just your body oh, okay you can't you can't bring like oh, i brought you a present a photo Mm-mm. okay yeah oh well 